11, 10, I don't want to waste more time on that. So this is the last uh, talk uh, for this season. The last but not least by far. I'm truly delighted and I would say honored to have Dylan Wattel with us today. Why? Because Dylan proved to be a stellar example uh, from STEM division to move on. Uh, he's been our student. Uh, the course correction that he mentioned here is because before he moved to biomedical field, he's been in history. So many things happened in his life and he moved on to biomedical field. I'm not going to tell you lots of details. I will tell you at this point that his goal is to be accepted as a medical student at medical school. And he has done a lot of things. His clinical, medical experience is huge. He has done the right things. And I think I am glad to see that today we have, I guess, your mostly students here. Uh, out of curiosity, are you related to biomedical field, uh, health sciences, and you? Yeah, anybody who is interested in the health sciences or has experience in it, please raise your hand. Okay, so that explains that. Um, so Dylan will tell you all the details about his career path. You can ask him any questions you want. Unfortunately, because I'm double booked, I need to meet with the provost and the president today for other things. I need to leave them, but we'll keep in touch. And Dad will take over about closing the events. Uh, okay. Dylan, thank you so much. Thank you, Elias. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Elias. Um, He's <laughs> good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Good. Uh, several months ago, I was contacted by Elias and representatives from the college asking how I'd feel about coming here, talking about my research, and more importantly, just telling my story. At first, I was really flattered, but then I thought, why me? To what do I owe this honor? There have been doctors here before me, mathematicians, scientists, esteemed professors. What could somebody in your position hope to learn from somebody like me? And the truth is that I'm here because I represent you. I was a student here. And the lessons that I learned here and success that I've had, and more importantly, the mistakes that I've made have shaped me into who I am today. With that in mind, I want to do something a little different than what's typically done at these speaker series. I want to talk about myself, something we're all not entirely comfortable doing, but something that's important to do from time to time. Self-evaluation is an important tool in the pathway to success. And I thought it was really important to dig up some memories, some events, and relive them, things that I thought were long gone. Uh, it's been cathartic and therapeutic to do this. So I wanted to talk about how I started from a really dark and uncertain place in my life and effectively altered the trajectory to end up here. Um, so thank you again for coming. My name is Dylan Waddell and this is Course Correction. Everyone in this room has gone through some sort of loss. We carry it with us. And for some of us, it weighs us down. And for others, it's a foundation upon which we can build ourselves and grow. In 2012, I graduated from undergrad. I had my degree in history. And I, a few months later, lost my mother to addiction. Uh, addiction runs in her family. Uh, taking her father before her as well. I'm sure there are some of us in here who have felt the hurt and pain of knowing a friend or loved one who has lost battle to addiction. My mother, Kathy, here seen choking me in my graduation photo, uh, was my guiding light. She was smart. She was kind. She was a really generous person. She instilled within me a sense of urgency to make something of myself, to always complete every task that I start 
and to be, well, quite frankly, as you can see here, incredibly sarcastic. I swear the motto in our family was, if you couldn't say something funny, don't say anything at all. But dig deeper, and you'll see somebody who was incredibly unsure of herself. She was fearful of success. She was afraid of the hard work it would take to get there. And because of that, she languished in mediocrity. She turned down a full ride scholarship to go to college, uh, choosing instead not to do anything. And she fell victim to the aforementioned coping mechanisms that I previously mentioned. When she passed away, I was devastated, but even more so that I was because that I was literally powerless to do anything about it. The situation, however, only got worse. Um, I didn't know it at the time, but my mother was irreparably, be irreparably behind on paying her mortgage. So a few weeks after she passed away, our home was foreclosed on and I was essentially homeless. I couldn't even afford to give her a proper funeral. So I moved around, I developed some self-destructive tendencies of my own, and I pushed people away. I saw that I was losing control over my life and it was something that I couldn't stand by and let happen. I decided from a place of insecurity and a place of perceived failure that it was time to make a change. What did I do? Well, I decided that a career change was the apt approach. I decided that I wanted to enter the healthcare field so that I could help other people. I decided I wanted to become a physician. <clears throat> It was a decision that I knew would take a lot of planning and hard work to execute. But growing up, I always knew that I wanted a career that allowed me to use my education to serve others, allowed me to form lasting and meaningful relationships with people, had a lot of civic engagement, and was also highly technical. At the time, when I was going through my loss, medicine was the clear choice. But when I was younger, I thought education fit that bill. <laughs> When I was growing up, I grew up in Parkside, not too far from here. Um, I grew up in a blue collar family, uh, but neither of my parents went to college. My dad didn't even finish high school. Um, I didn't have uh, you know, professional connections in the healthcare field. You know, my family was just getting by. So when the time came to make a career decision, I chose education because I thought it fit a majority of what I wanted out of my career. But as time went on and the loss that I suffered, I decided to revisit uh, what I wanted out of a career. And in the wake of my mother's passing and also in keeping with the you know, ideals she instilled within me to you know, make something of myself and to stick to every task that I, wanted to, uh, that I started, I decided that medicine was the right choice. So I knew this wouldn't be an overnight change. The mere idea of pulling you know, a career in educational 180 after spending all of these years in college was terrifying. At that point, it was 2013 and like not the best time to be entering the job field or job market, you know, great recession. So I was really scared to go back to school to make different career changes. You know, what if I didn't make it? What if this was pointless? What if I ended up failing? What if I ended up not me meeting my goal at the end? And then I realized that Essentially, the only thing keeping me from going through with this and keeping me from doing this was me. The hardest step of every great journey is the first one. After that, you're already on your way. So I came up with a system. And it's something that I've refined over the past few years and something I continuously use. It's a, essentially a circle <laughs> with different steps, and the first step being evaluating where I am. I talked about in the beginning that self-evaluation is a really important tool in the path to success. To constantly be critical of who you are and what you're doing and how that applies to your goals. And it's honestly, it's a very tough thing to do, to look at all of your applicable accomplishments and see how it stacks up to what you want to be. So looking at myself at that point, I realized that if I wanted to be in medicine, I had to make some serious changes. I had zero clinical experience. I had zero research experience. I had zero contacts in the healthcare field, and I had zero exposure to medicine. On top of that, I was severely lacking in the curriculum department and academic skills necessary to succeed. I had only taken two science classes ever because I was compelled to do so to graduate, and two math classes ever because literally I was compelled to do so to graduate. And these were all like math for non-majors, science for non-majors, 
So I realized that I'd have to take things like chemistry, physics, biology, anatomy and physiology, even if I just wanted to be competitive, to hit that baseline. So at this point, looking at myself, evaluating myself, it was looking like I really wasn't stacking up. So what was I going to do? I moved on to step two, planning. I researched different degree requirements for different schools. I saw what all of the local colleges were offering. I saw all of the different career paths that people were talking about. I went to open houses. I saw what each medical school required for courses, required for experience, required for research. And this could be applicable to any other career field, nursing, you know, physician's assistant, anything else, you know, medical assistant. I looked at what they needed for me to be accepted to their program. I also planned on just successfully enrolling in school and completing a semester just to see if I could handle the science aspect of it. So enter Delaware County Community College in 2013. I enrolled here in the fall of 2013, uh, looking to start in the spring of 2014. And I would just take it easy. I would take Chem 1, Bio 1, and Physics 1. Just whet my appetite see if I can set a baseline of academic performance, and if I did well enough, I could then move on. I could then incorporate clinical experience. I could then incorporate volunteer work. I could then incorporate maybe finding a new job in the research field. And then on top of that, you know, if I could look into, if I wanted to take more difficult classes, if I wanted to you know, keep here at Delaware County, or if I wanted to transition to applying to grad school, if I wanted to apply to like a pre-professional program before going to professional school. So. Plans change, though, and plans evolve. I knew that I was essentially starting over, but this is something that I felt comfortable I could do in two years. So plans change, plans evolve. Well, a few uh, days after I actually enrolled here, uh, my father came to me with the news that he had terminal lung cancer. Um, and he was also uh, deciding that he wasn't going to pursue any sort of treatment. So plans change, plans evolve. I probably should have waited at that point to continue enrolling in school. People probably wouldn't have faulted me if I quit or gave up at that point. You know, say like, this is something I'll revisit in a few years. Uh, but after talking with my father about that, you know, he confessed to me, and this is a guy seriously not known for his sentiment ever. Um, he confessed that he was proud of me, that I was making these changes. And he reminded me that if I started a task, I should finish it. So. I knew the task ahead of me would be monumental. I knew that I'd have to balance working full time, going to school full time, and taking care of a terminally ill family member full time. Save for the occasional help of a really amazing in-home hospice nurse. I gotta give her a shout out, she was great. So I revisited my planning stage. I knew that I would have to get a new job. I knew that I'd have to get a job closer to home and one that could allow me to be flexible enough to go to school and also take care of my dad. So I got a new job working for the finance department at QVC in Westchester, something that was close to home. I knew a majority of my courses were already at night, so I had that going for me. But more importantly, I had to set up a schedule and stick to it if it was something I was gonna be successful with. So, follow through. Planning is important. Or evaluation is important, planning is crucial, but without follow through, all of this falls apart. I knew that if I wanted to succeed this first semester, I had to nail my basics academically. Just focus on doing well. Don't try to be too complicated about it. Just do well in all my tests and all my courses. I knew I had to provide a, you know, care for my dad and spend time with him. I knew that in order to do this, I had to make a schedule and stick to it. But I also knew that there would have to be a lot of sacrifices. Uh, you know, they, if anybody's ever seen that triangle where it says, like, pick two of the three, like, get enough sleep, see your friends, or do well in school, and you can pick two of the three. Well, I felt like I was having to pick, like, one of the three, and it was do well in school. So I knew that I'd have to delay gratification. I knew that I'd have to focus on just doing these things. So just to give you a accurate, semi-accurate you know, example of what my weekday schedule was like, I would literally get up at 5 or 5.30 just to study. Uh, 7 a.m., I would have my morning routine with my dad where I would you know, try to get him up, make sure he took all of his pain meds, and make sure that he ate his breakfast. And more accurately, it was actually arguing with him for about 20 minutes to make sure he ate his breakfast. I don't know if anybody has ever had to you know, uh, work with a family member who's going through a terminal illness. Just because they're going through that does not mean they're not the same person and won't argue with you. <laughs> at 7.30, I was off to work. And at lunch, I would come home and check on him. 
you know, make sure he, if he needed help, literally getting to the bathroom and getting back, making sure he was comfortable. Uh, after work, four to five, I'd come home, I'd check in with him, make his dinner, make sure he was bathed, and also then I'd go to class. I'd go to my evening course, and afterwards, that'd be my time. If I didn't have to check in with him, that's when I would do things like grocery shopping, laundry, and more importantly, that's when I get a majority of my studying done. This looks like it probably isn't sustainable, uh, but it is through discipline. Uh, sticking to this schedule and making sure that you know, I took care of myself and took care of everything I needed to, I was able to do it. So I knew in order to be successful, I really had to sort of break down how difficult school was and conquer it. I knew one thing I could do was try to eliminate as much risk and risk mitigation as possible when I, when I started school. Uh, just to put this in a framework of a story, uh, my first day of class here, I was like nervous. I, I don't know why. I was studying something completely new. I had been away from school for two years, but like I was actually nervous when I got here. So what I did was I identified all of the weaknesses that I had before and tried to actively make changes so that I wouldn't fall victim to them again. I knew that I was the kind of person that would forget due dates and forget when things were happening and forget to study and just like not pay attention. So I actively made sure that when I got the syllabus for the first day, I put all of the dates on an electronic calendar with reminders so I knew exactly when things were due. You know, I would set like a week out reminder to study for a test or something like that. I also knew I wasn't the type of person who could study for two hours at a time. So I made sure that I built in study time to my schedule and also build it in so that it was like 30 minutes at a time with 10 minutes off, 30 minutes at a time with 10 minutes off. And I built in certain days to study for different subjects. I also built a support network. You know, I, my first day of class when I was here, I found all of the people that were really prepared for school their first day. And I associated myself with them. I looked for the people that first week who did all their reading, who asked all their questions, you know, who seemed like they had you know, been in school recently or had familiarity with this subject. And I associated myself with them because not only are these people who you can become friends with, who think differently than you, you know, they can teach you things like study skills or help you out with areas that you're weak on and vice versa. These are people that can hold you accountable. Um, I also got to know my professors, which I think is you know, something more people should try to do. Uh, these are people who can provide you with more resources, study tips, feedback, and most importantly, mentorship. Um, I was really new to the science field. I didn't know which path I wanted to take. And actually, two of the people here that I consider you know, really formative in my decision making while I was here and mentoring was uh, John Politano, he taught Bio 1, and Dr. Stephen Lin, who I actually see in the back here, who is my A&P professor. Thank you for coming. <laughs> You know, he really helped me too in deciding that this was the right career path for me. And also administration. If you're going through a tough time and you have some sort of you know, extraneous circumstance that's affecting your life, you know, be honest and upfront with these people. Let them know what you're going through. They'd be more than happy to accommodate you sometimes. And also uh, the business, or not the business office, uh, career services helped me out a lot too. When I was looking to go to school and looking to transfer and things like that, they were more than happy to help me get all my materials together. Anyway, the point is I'm trying to make is that there are tools in your toolbox that you can use to be successful in school. Uh, one of them being risk mitigation, just figuring out where your weaknesses are and eliminating them. Build your support network. Your friends, family, and even significant others are people that can help you, you know, stay on track, hold you accountable. My fiance is here today. She's over there up in the front. Kendra, she helped me through a lot of really tough times. Uh, discipline, sticking to your schedule, developing resilience and compartmentalizing, saying when I'm studying, I'm studying. I'm not going to look at my phone. I'm not going to worry about all these terrible things that are happening. I'm not going to worry about you know, work or anything like that. And most importantly, at the very last year, self-care. Uh, I think this is something that is understated, that taking time for yourself, making sure that you know, you're in the right mental headspace, making sure that you're staying healthy, you're getting enough sleep is something that not enough people do. So as time went on, uh, the situation with my dad only got worse. He was getting weaker. He was in more pain. He was sleeping less, and he was doing less. And he was losing his willpower. It became increasingly challenging to balance school, taking care of him, and going to work. 
it seemed more and more likely that this situation was probably going to get the best of me, even though I didn't want it to. I've had a few days that I would consider the worst days of my life. Um, but for our purposes here, I'll talk about just one that happened during that first semester. So does anyone remember the polar vortex or snowpocalypse in 2013? Um, I was driving home from work. It was like February, I think. And it was like blizzard conditions. And I'd just gotten home to the driveway of the house I was renting for us. And the driveway was just stacked with snow. And I knew I actually was not going to be able to pull my car into the driveway. So I parked it on the street, realizing that it was probably going to be buried by the snowplow by the time I came back out. So I trudged up my driveway to my garage. And in my garage, I had just bought a new snowblower. And I had like my salt, my shovel, and my snowblower inside the garage. And as I literally went in to go twist the key and open up the garage, the key snapped off. And I'm just sitting there, and it's just blizzard conditions. My face is freezing. I'm soaked. And I'm just like, just standing there like in a trance, like, oh my god, this situation cannot get worse. And I also knew that there were no windows on the garage. So I was not getting that thing until literally the snow melted. So I went inside. I sat down at my dining room table. I put my books down. And I just, like, just sat there with my head in my hands. And just thinking that like this situation was just so terrible. And I have a physics exam on Friday. So we've all been in situations where we thought everything was unfair, everything was against us, and we were the only person that this was all happening to. It's a really toxic headspace, seriously. Um, and I was in it. I was literally on the verge of crying that this situation was getting the best of me. I was the only person here taking care of him. I was trying to balance work, trying to get by, trying to pay all of our bills, and also trying to do well in school. And at that moment, I heard a crash from upstairs. And I snapped out of it. I walked upstairs. Well, more aptly, I ran upstairs. I opened the door, and my dad, who was like this six foot tall, 225 guy, he was a veteran, he was a huge built dude, like my entire life, had gone to get up, and his legs were so weak from being in bed that he actually collapsed onto his end table, which was glass, and shattered it. And it was at that moment that I realized that this guy, who was just this huge, imposing figure, this guy I looked up to my entire life, was like the size of a child. He was crying on the floor in the fetal position. So I went down, I comforted him, I made sure he was OK. I picked him up, I got him to the bathroom, he got sick, I cleaned him up. I went back to the room, I cleaned up the room, I cleaned up the little bit of blood that was on the carpet. I got him in the bed, I made sure that he was comfortable and taken care of, and I stayed with him until he fell asleep. And then I went back downstairs and got back to studying. It's a tough situation, um, but it's the sort of thing that you realize that you don't have a choice and you gotta keep going through it. There would be more challenging days than this one, but this one sticks with me forever because it was at that moment that I realized that I had truly found my purpose. You know, I wanted to go into medicine to help people. I wanted to go into medicine because I felt like I was a failure in some degrees. But I realized at that point that I was cut out to be a caretaker. I was somebody that this person could be comforted by and that's somebody that I could take care of. So that winter, I learned a lot about what it means to be a caretaker. And I knew that in order for all of this to make, mean something, I had to keep going. So um, a few weeks later, during finals, uh, my first semester during finals week, my father went into hospice. Uh, that first finals week, I stayed there with him. I actually uh, took one of my finals in the conference room at Taylor Hospice. I spent some time there studying, but more importantly, I just spent time being there with him and uh, making sure that he was comfortable and not alone when he passed. After that, I was devastated. I didn't know what to do. I took a few days to think about it, but ultimately I kept coming back to the same thing, that in order for this to mean something, I had to keep going. I'm sure there have been people in this room right now who have lost somebody, and they're doing what they're doing for them, and they want to have, give purpose to that sacrifice, and that was what I was trying to do. So step one, re-evaluation. What did I want? I still wanted a career in medicine, I still wanted a career in healthcare. What's motivating me now? 
mom, dad, and the purpose that I felt now that I wanted to be a caretaker. What have I accomplished so far? I did really well my first semester. I took care of my dad. What are the obstacles standing in my way? I still need some prerequisites. I still need clinical experience. I still need research experience. So, planning. Keep taking courses here. Start incorporating clinical experience. Keep going to work. And if I was successful at gaining clinical experience, I could build a professional network. So, step three, follow through. Over the next year and a half, I would finish here at Delaware County. Um, I would finish with Chem 2, Bio 2, Physics 2, um, AMP 1 and 2, and Orgo 1 and 2. As my academic success grew, so too did my confidence that I could really make this happen. I sought out increasingly complex clinical in involvement locally. Um, and if anybody wants me to go into detail about how I did that and how I sought out some like pretty cool experiences, I can talk about that afterwards. Especially anybody who's interested in medicine, nursing, or physician's assistant programs, uh, this would be really, really good experience for you. Um, so I finished here in 2016. I earned my associate's degree in the process. Um, I had applied the fall prior um, to this program called the St. Mary Medical Center's uh, Summer Pre-Med Program, which was essentially a program that takes students from all over the country and allows them to have unrestricted access to their hospital and healthcare system so they can shadow any department that they want, anything from trauma surgery to the emergency department to pediatrics, pediatric ED, uh, plastics, neurology, neurosurgery, cardiology, thoracic surgery. Um, if the previous year had taught me how to be a caretaker, that experience taught me what I wanted out of a career in medicine and what fields I was interested in. And more importantly, actually, what fields I wasn't interested in. Um, so what was next? Well, the goal always was and has been medical school. So I had to go through another reevaluation phase. And I swear this gets easier the more times you do it. I know I sound like a broken record at this point, but this is actually a really helpful tool that I've used time and time again. So my career goals still haven't changed. Uh, what have I accomplished? I got my associate's degree. I had a majority of my prerequisites met, but I still needed some more if I, was, if I wanted to be competitive. So that was an area to improve on. I still needed some more clinical experience. I had plenty through St. Mary, but I wanted somewhere I was actually hands-on. And I also needed some research experience. So I knew that um, I needed more volunteer experience as well. Uh, St. Mary Medical Center offered a uh, ability for me to do like patient transport, um, work in their summer camp, volunteer in their community store, and also deliver care packages to like veteran patients. Um, but I knew that I wanted something else, and especially as you know, we enter you know, this modern age of medicine. Uh, I wanted something that allowed me to interact with different patient demographics than my own. You know, I think it's really important um, to eliminate as many you know, disparities related to demographics in healthcare as possible. So, planning. I knew that I would have to move on from Delaware County, so I decided that a pre-professional school was the best choice for me. This was the most efficient way for me to check all those boxes of prerequisites that I needed. Courses, research, employment, and volunteer experience. So I applied to the University of Pennsylvania because they had such a significant healthcare presence in the area. But there are other programs that offer uh, you know, a post-baccalaureate or pre-professional school program, such as Bryn Mawr College, Jefferson, and Temple. And these are all schools that, ha that have that program. And the point of that program is to prepare you for professional school. Uh, things like dental school, veterinary school and medical school and other different professional programs. So I could take the courses I needed there. I could get the volunteer experience that I needed. I could also get the research experience I needed and clinical exposure. So my planning paid off. I was accepted to the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, for the next two and a half years leading me to where I am now, uh, have been some of the most exciting and dynamic uh, experiences I've had in medicine so far. So follow through. Like I said, I was, I was accepted and I was able to take competitive courses in biochemistry, histology, cell bio, microbio, molecular bio, genetics, sensory perception of neural anatomy. And also because of the way the Penn program was set up, I was able to actually take courses through the different colleges within the university. So I was able to take math classes through the Wharton School of Business. I was able to take science classes through the medical school like immunobiology. And I would also, at this time, actually leave my job. 
and decided to take the leap of faith and try to find employment at Penn doing research. So I sought help to go through with that, just like I had sought help here at Delaware County. I talked to my advisors, I talked to my faculty, I talked to you know, present and previous students to see like what pathways they had taken to get to where they are. So I started to refine my purpose. I knew that I wanted a career in medicine, but what was interesting to me? Um, through my experience at St. Mary Medical Center and through my experience with my dad going through lung cancer, I knew I had an interest in cardiovascular anatomy, specifically pulmonary medicine and thoracic surgery. Um, so this led to my interest to conduct research in those areas. And now we're going to kind of switch gears and talk less about my story and more about the research that I'm doing now. So in 2016, I started at the Christie Labs at the University of Pennsylvania. I worked for both the Perlman School of Medicine Center for Translational Lung Biology, as well as the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania's Division of Pulmonology and Critical Care. Do you have, do you have a question? I saw you raise your hand. Okay, sorry. No, no worries. Um, this opportunity uh, granted me the ability to conduct research as well as gain valuable clinical experience. Um, the studies that I worked on uh, were the lung transplant and microbiome, chronic allograft and dysfunction study, as well as its accompanying stent study. An allograft just means transplant between two non-identical but similar patients. Um, I also worked on the clinical and molecular epidemiology of acute kidney injury after lung transplantation. And soon, pulmonary medicine and thoracic surgery became my focus and led into what I'm actually doing now. So, using scientific knowledge that I gained here and at the University of Pennsylvania, I worked with a team of doctors and researchers to analyze the effects of the lung microbiome on lung transplantation outcomes. Microbiome is just sort of an ecosystem that lives within you of microorganisms, and they can either be commensal, symbiotic, or pathogenic in nature, and it's sort of just a thumbprint of microorganisms that are unique to you. We all have them living inside our body at any given time. I'm sure we've all heard the term probiotic before, referring to healthy gut bacteria. You know, that microflora that lives within your gut is unique to you. It's not 100% identical to anybody else. Um, so with that presents a certain challenge when transplanting any organs, but specifically lungs, in that you know, your recipient and your donor will have two different microbiomes that have to interact with each other. So, a lung transplant is a really complex procedure. Given a successful match with the donor and a successful surgery, many patients face really challenging recoveries. Uh, every organ recipient is put on a bunch of medications to prevent organ rejection. All of these drugs are immunosuppressive in nature. And for our lung transplant patients, because unlike a heart or a kidney, the lung actually directly interacts with the outside environment. So they have to also be put on a plethora of um, antibiotics, antifungals, and antivirals just to give them a chance to survive because at any given time, they are breathing in potentially contaminated air with immunocompromised systems. Add on top of that the complexity of having two microbiomes that are interacting with each other, and in some cases, what is commensal in the donor may be pathogenic in the recipient and may cause some adverse reactions, you know, leading to things such as you know, acute cellular rejection or a type of graft versus host disease known as bronchiolitis obliterans syndrome, which literally causes damage to the small airways, causing the lung transplant to be unsuccessful. So our job here was through analysis of cultures taken from our patients, bronchoscopies, imaging, and also just reviewing their medications and how it actually um, affected them was to do a longitudinal review of this patient's outcome and see how we could then improve it for future patients to, re to reduce um, rejection. So at that time, while I was at Penn, I also wanted to get involved in the community. I think civic engagement is a really important part of anyone, should be a really important part of anyone's life, not just someone in healthcare. Um, I realized that Philadelphia would be a unique opportunity to do so. Uh, given the fact that there's you know, so many, such a dense degree of different populations in Philadelphia, I would have a chance to interact with a bunch of different people. Um, I also saw that I had gone through a transition. I had you know, started making this change in my life to enter this new career field. And people at Penn were going through the same thing. So I took it upon myself to become a peer mentor. 
I started helping people who were making this transition into school make their own transition. You know, people who were moving from far away to go to school, people who hadn't been in school for a long time, who needed help you know, identifying courses they should take, um, identifying you know, volunteer experiences, or even something like finding research and employment that, they, that fitted them. So I wanted to be that person that I wish I had had access to. And that actually also led to something interesting. I mentioned this earlier, but um, one of the things that I'm interested in is uh, mitigating healthcare disparities between different patient demographics in modern medicine. And I wanted some new exposure to different demographics and things like that when I was in Philadelphia. So with a friend um, and a faculty member from Penn, we decided to create a new program with this actually in mind. Um, there are other programs like this where you could gain exposure to different cultures, gain cultural competency at, in Philadelphia, like Puentes de Salud, but none that have this explicitly in their mission statement. So we created a program called Pen Chime, and Pen Chime stands for uh, Penn's Chinese Medical Exchange, and our goal was to interact with a brand, a culture none of us were very familiar with, uh, which ended up being uh, Philadelphia's Chinese culture and Chinese population. Uh, we specifically worked with Chinese students that were studying abroad in America, and we provided them a safe space where they could come to us with questions, they could come to us for college help, and they could come to us with anything that they needed help on, such as you know cultural knowledge or language skills. And we created a mutually beneficial organizational layout where we, in turn, gained from them cultural knowledge and also Chinese language skills. Another aspect of this that we wanted to do to help prepare us even further for you know, future clinical experience as physicians was incorporate a clinical element into this. So we decided early on that using contacts from the University of Pennsylvania, including the Wharton China Center, and also Chinese faculty members and students and their families, that we would plan a trip to China over the summer in 2018. And I'll touch more on that later. So through my work at the Christie Lab when I was doing research in lung transplantation, I came into contact with a group of students who were known as the Harrison Surgical Scholars. Um, it was unlike anything else I had ever heard of existing before. It was a opportunity that allowed you to be part clinician and also part researcher and do some pretty exciting things uh, where you got to go actually on procurement and assist in the lung transplant surgery. So for the past year, so for the past year, I've been one of two Harrison Surgical Scholars at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, working for the uh, Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania's Division of Cardiovascular Surgery. Uh, recognizing my interests in the field as well as my research contributions to the Perlman School of Medicine, uh, Center for Translational Lung Biology, and the uh, D Division of Pulmonology and Critical Care, I was recruited by surgeons from the aforementioned service to work for them. I rotate between three roles in this program. Uh, where I go on procurement, actually traveling to the donor site uh, to recover the transplanted lungs. I also work on implantation, uh, where I conduct research at HUP on patients who are receiving uh, donated lungs. And I also conduct research. So my first role, procurement, uh, sees me on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week when I'm on duty to travel via ambulance, private car, or jet, or helicopter. Uh, to donor hospitals, basically all up and down the East Coast and as far as, I think Milwaukee was the farthest that we went west. Um, I assist, I, I provide first surgical assistance to the attending surgeon that I accompany. I act as an extra set of hands and eyes for him. And uh, I also facilitate all communication regarding our valuation of the lungs with HUP and also ensure safe transport of the lungs. Uh, touching a little more on the first surgical assistance aspect of it, Intraoperatively, I provide all assistance to him when we're evaluating the lungs, uh, from the point of, of learning how to review imaging with him, to the point of doing the bronchoscopy, actually looking at the lungs internally, operating the bronchoscope under guidance, opening the thorax, the chest cavity, and actually visually appraising the lungs, and the explantation of the lungs itself, and surgical preparation for transplantation, as well as things like taking arterial blood gases to evaluate blood metrics, uh, like gas exchange or pH to make sure that our donors are healthy. Um, it seems to happen that um, when I'm on call, it seems to happen in the middle of the night, 
and I'm literally on a plane or a helicopter and in another state before the sun comes up. You know, there have been weeks where I have been in five states by Thursday when I'm on call. Uh, this is something that actually I, I'm really proud of and something that I think has really prepared me for the rigors of medicine and something that, you know, as an experience is something that I won't forget. So my second role is implantation. Uh, also on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week when I'm on this. Um, when I get the call that we had a lung that's accepted for transplant, I travel to our hospital in the University of Pennsylvania and I meet with the family who's, uh, and the patient who's receiving the lung transplant. I make sure that they're all up to speed on what's going on and I make sure that they are aware or consent to any of the research studies that we wish them to participate in. Uh, I'm there to answer their questions, quell any concerns, and I think that you know, from my experience, having had a family member who's gone through you know, a really serious illness, I'm able to kind of connect with these people a little more, and I think they recognize that. You know, I, I have really never had anybody say no <laughs> to me <laughs> when I go to consent them, and I think that it's my ability to connect with these people from the experiences I've had. Um, while I'm there, I also conduct research um, preoperatively, intraoperatively, and postoperatively, which I'll touch on in just a moment. So the research aspect of my job, on top of the clinical aspect, I also have the research aspect. I conduct research in both the OR at the donor site and the OR at the recipient hospital, as well as in a lab. Uh, while in the OR, I'm conducting samples for what we call a biorepository, also known as biobank or a, a library. We're, connecting, we're collecting samples that are similar at different time points along the way of the operations. So I'm collecting blood, urine, and biopsies from our donor. I'm collecting blood, urine, and biopsies from our recipient preoperatively, intraoperatively, and postoperatively. And that yields um, a set of identical samples that we can then put into a library from which we can then design future experiments to do from. Uh, essentially gives us this you know, reserve of tissue and reserve of genetic material that we can use for any future experiment. Uh, on top of that, we're also doing some other exciting things in the OR itself. Uh, we're experimenting with cryoablation right now. Essentially, we're applying a cold probe intraoperatively during the thoracotomy. Uh, a thoracotomy, also known as a clamshell incision, is a incision here between the ribs to expose the lungs so that we, when we remove them to transplant a lung, um, we actually attach a cold probe to the intercostal nerves so that we can then numb the area so that we can help patients you know, enhance their recovery. This is a very traumatic surgery, very painful. We can enhance their recovery times and also subsequently decrease post-operative opioid consumption. You know, as somebody who has had a family member who's you know, struggled with addiction and addictive tendencies, uh, some, anything that can help prevent the use of post-operative opioids or post-operative pain medications is really important to me. On top of that, um, I also help administer the University of Pennsylvania's Lung Corps. Um, not every lung that goes to transplant, sorry, let me back up, not every lung that somebody donates who is an organ donor necessarily goes to transplant. Sometimes they go to research. And if they go to research at, in Philadelphia, they typically come to me. Um, I work with an organization called Gift of Life, and Gift of Life is what's known as an organ procurement organization. They help hospitals match their people who are on their lung transplant waiting list, their recipients, with donors in different areas. They, they work as the middleman facilitating um, getting the information to the hospital so they can evaluate potential donors. If a lung is donated and it's not feasible to be transplanted, I typically take them for research and I disseminate them to about 13 different collaborating studies. Uh, by today, about the time of this talk, I will have handled personally and disseminated, dissected about 100 lungs and I guess about 150 uh, by time this summer when I finish the program. We also do what's called EVLP. Some of those lungs that aren't fit for transplant uh, and aren't fit but are not quite fit for research that are a little better, we also use EVLP. Uh, we do what's called ex vivo lung perfusion where we actually hook the lung up to a breathing machine and actually perfuse the lung outside of the body. Uh, that way we can test different surgical techniques, we can test um, different cutting edge aerosol drugs, we can test radioactive nanoparticles, different things like that. Uh, micro dissection, we can test new uh, cutting edge bronchoscopes and uh, we, do, we do that at the University of Pennsylvania as well. Switching back, um, I wanted to take a break from Chime and come back to it here because I actually saw a really interesting overlap take place. Um, when I went to China in, the August, in August of 2018, the first place we went to was a city called Zhengzhou in China's Henan province. 
and we worked at the Henan Provincial People's Hospital. And it allowed me to see uh, different departments uh, within their hospital, including the emergency department, the ICU, pulmonary medicine, plastics, which is actually more reconstructive in nature in China, instead of like people getting Botox and stuff like that whenever you think of plastic surgery. Um, pediatrics and also thoracic surgery. Um, and that was important for me because I got to then interact directly with Chinese lung transplant surgeons and compare our practices and our techniques with them in China and actually go observe them work. Um, so I was actually fortunate enough to actually get into the OR, see surgeries, um, and work with them. There's actually, I don't know if you guys can see it, it's kind of dark. It's actually like the top three transplant surgeons at that hospital right there. Um, while I was there, I made some friendships that I have to this day. And also, we're looking at exploring future research partnerships with them, um, just because we have access to such a large patient database for transplants in China. I also did some fun things, too, while I was there. We can talk about that later if you want. After Zhengzhou, uh, we went to a place called Hangzhou, uh, which is further south. It's on the Pacific coast. And there, um, we saw something really interesting. We got to go to some traditional Chinese medicine hospitals and actually see uh, which I thought was very important, the intersection of modern medical practices with traditional Chinese medicine, and just gain a greater understanding and appreciation for you know, how a culture far different from yours views your role as a physician and views medicine in their culture. Uh, if you see here, actually, um, I was like, I woke up really sick that day um, with like a really sore throat, and they decided that that was a perfect opportunity to show me some traditional Chinese medicine. So they laid me on the table, and you can't see it, there's a giant acupuncture needle through my right ear. And I also have sticking out of my neck, uh, wormwood. And the wormwood actually was lit on fire. And as it burned down on my neck, it got really, really hot and really, really hot, and I'm just getting really uncomfortable. As you can see, they're fanning me. And I'm smiling, but I'm in a little bit of pain. You can see my, my, my artery <laughs> jumping out there. Um, I'll tell you what, I didn't have a sore throat after that. Um, so that was a really interesting experience and one that I won't easily forget. After we um, finished in Hangzhou, we went back to Beijing. And there I visited the Penn Wharton China Center, but also more importantly, we entered our volunteer work and our service aspect of our trip. I did some work with the New Day Foster Home in Beijing, uh, which is an American-run orphanage. And it provides specialized medical care and dental care uh, to orphan Chinese children uh, the Chinese um, foster system, I, I'm not 100% sure on this, but from what I understand, they typically age kids out at about 14 years old, which I don't know anybody in here who thought they could take care of themselves at 14 years old, let alone if you had a very serious disability or medical need. So this, this home here is actually here so they can get the life-saving surgery that they need. A lot of these children were abandoned. Uh, one of the kids that uh, we worked with directly, literally was abandoned on a railroad track with his intestines exposed after he'd been hit by a train. His parents just left him. So they took him under their care and supervision, made sure he got the surgery that he needed, and he was then later adopted by an American family. So this was an interesting experience and one that, you know, I mentioned earlier that one aspect I really wanted a career was to use my education for service. So. I think something that I want to incorporate in my future practice as a physician is going to different parts of the world you know, who might be experiencing these said healthcare disparities and doing what I can to use my education for service. So this kind of brings me to where I am today. Um, I'm still a Harrison Surgical Scholar. Um, I'm still actively involved in the groups that I've mentioned previously. Um, and I have essentially made this transition. I'm not the same person that I was at the beginning of this presentation. I'm not the same person that I was six years ago. Um, I'm very happy and proud of the changes I made, and I hope that what I've given you here today, a little snapshot of my life, can be beneficial in some regards. That, you know, through self-evaluation, being really critical of yourself and what you want, planning and following through and really following through, you can get where you want to be too. Um, I'm currently in my first application cycle for medical school. I'm waiting to hear back. So fingers crossed that I get in. Um, and that would be a very exciting opportunity. So if anybody has any questions or concerns or anything they want to talk about and want me to elaborate on further, I'd be happy to take them now. I think we have a few minutes left. Yeah? Um, with your clinical experience that you said you worked at in the very beginning, where you got to kind of shadow, um, can you just talk about that a little bit? How to kind of yeah. Um, 
So I didn't have any professional connections from family. I'm not sure if you have any things like that. I, I just went around and literally started asking my friends if they had any family members or friends who were doctors and if they wouldn't mind me shadowing them. Literally my first experience was I went and went to a family dermatology clinic and just like got some hours. And then I was like, okay, I can deal with this. I like this. And I started literally just going on to Google and Googling clinical shadowing experience in Philadelphia. And I found forums. I found stuff like that. And there's there's actually like a weird underworld of medical student forums where they talk about where they got all of their clinical experiences and stuff like that. And I found this one called uh, St. Mary Medical Center's Summer Pre-Med Program. And like, like I mentioned, it was a summer long internship where you got unrestricted access to the hospital. If you wanted to shadow a nurse, you could. If you wanted to shadow a PA, you could. If you wanted to shadow a physician, you could. I think they typically start accepting, or accepting applications in the winter for the summer. So um, that's something that's really good if you're making the transition to like a professional school or pre-professional school to have that like the summer beforehand. Uh, they take people from all over the country. So I would say if, if you're looking to apply, you know, do it soon. I'd be happy to like write a recommendation for somebody if they get to know me. So any questions? Um, you had one. Um, because I really hadn't had a specific focus such as like microbiology or something like that that I felt like I could feel comfortable getting my master's in, I was still very much trying to find what was interesting to me and I thought research would unlock that. If I for some reason uh, needed to ever get a master's again, I think I know what I would be interested in, but I thought the post-baccalaureate program was a very like financially smart decision. It wasn't terribly expensive and also provided me with a support network and it provided me with the ability to go to different colleges within the university because I still needed like math prerequisites and I was like, hey, math from Wharton sounds pretty cool. So, yeah. Anybody else? Seriously, any questions about my personal life, about what I did or experiences or anything is fair game. You said you would take 10 minutes uh, break in between your study time. Yeah. Um, yeah, stay away from Reddit or Instagram. Um, <laughs> those are like my big ones. Um, so the things I would do during those 10 minutes, um, you know, I'd get a snack. I'd try to like drink a bottle of water or something like that. Um, I would, honestly, I would sometimes go on my phone too, but you're right, that, that can be distracting. So you got to set like a timer for that 10 minutes too. Um, I would, you know, sometimes like I would, if I was falling asleep, I'd just like bust out some push-ups or something. So, um, anybody else? This is really informal. Go ahead. If you had to do it all over again, what would you do differently? If I had to do it all over again, what would I do differently? Um, hmm. I think it's, that's really hard to say um, because even the mistakes I've made have helped shape me into who I am. I think. Uh, so many people look at their mistakes they made in such a negative, like, ooh, kind of way. Um, but a lot of times we're here because of our mistakes, too. Uh, if I had to do it again, um, I think I would be more aggressive earlier on about finding better clinical experiences. I would have taken that leap of faith and just, like, search Google instead of, like, asking around. You know, I would have been more aggressive. I would say that over time I've learned to be more aggressive about what I want. So just be more confident in myself, I would say, too. You know, I, I thought because I, even coming here today, I was like, why do they want to have me speak here? What have I done? And looking back on it, yeah, I checked some of those boxes for the people that are, have also been here too. Uh, but I'm, you know, I, again, just need to be more aggressive. So, anybody else? Seriously, I don't bite. What are the medical schools that you're looking at right now that you think you would enjoy? Um, I applied to all the Philadelphia medical schools. Um, I applied to some in Texas, some in Florida. Um, some in New York and some in New England. I'm um, looking to kind of stay around the East Coast. So, I have a lot of family here. Um, so, yeah. Yes, Temple Temple is more known for that. I know Penn has a matriculation program, but you have to be what's known as a core student which means you basically have to come in fresh with no science experience in order to be eligible for that. So that's a little hiccup that actually, going back, here's one thing I would have changed, that I might have explored that option first, but coming here was smart because I, like I said, I wet my appetite for science. I wasn't even sure if I could you know, handle this. So going to University of Pennsylvania and dropping you know, 
literally a bunch of thousands of dollars on an education that I wasn't sure if I even wanted to do was a scary idea to me. So this is a really smart option uh, coming here and just like getting prepared for your next step. You're not scaring me. Um, I would go through like my circle again. I would reevaluate what didn't work out for me. You know, I have some areas that I wish I could improve on, um, and that might be a good time for me to address that during that second application cycle. You know, I might try to improve some test scores. I might apply to different schools. I might take more time to, you know, really vet my letters, and especially like personal statements and stuff like that. Like go to some more writing centers and stuff like that. Like not just get help from one. So use m more resources that I have available to me. I'm happy to take some questions informally at the end. I think we're a little past our time right now. But if anybody wants to come down and talk to me personally, I'd be happy to do that. If anybody wants my email, I can put that up too. Um, the attendance sheet is here. If anybody did not sign it, please sign it. And again, thank you to Mr. Waddell for helping us and helping you to reevaluate your standings and constantly reevaluate and stay focused. Have a good day, everyone.